Washington, thank you for joining us. A special welcome to our in-person audience. Uh, and hello and good afternoon and good evening to those tuning in from Europe and around the globe. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Atlantic Council front page conversation featuring the Executive Vice President of the European Commission, Margrethe Vestager. Uh, Madam Executive Vice President, welcome. It's great to have you with us in Washington. We hosted you virtually in June 2020 for our ninth ever Atlantic Council front page, our premier platform for global leaders that we created in the digital space during COVID, when everyone was just getting the hang of virtual convenings and dialing in via Zoom. Nearly three, le three years later, and after 83 front page events with the world's top decision makers, it's an honor to host you in person. Looking back, it's remarkable how much has changed in three years, two marked by COVID-19 and then uh, 2022 forged by Putin's unprovoked and criminal war in Ukraine. Jean Monnet is credited with saying, quote, Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted for those crises, unquote. Indeed, crisis is not new for Europe, nor are history's myriad challenges to the unity and effectiveness of its member states. Even with that said, this is a particularly important inflection point for Europe, uh, in my view, no less important than the periods after World War I, World War II, and after the Cold War. Russia's full-scale war of Ukraine has sparked a rewiring of Europe from its defense and security policy to energy, trade, and much more. The executive vice president is responsible for a great deal. It's one of the most robust per portfolios of the European Union. She's re responsible for, quote, a Europe fit for the digital age, one of the European Commission's six priorities for the five-year period between 2019 and 2024. She's also the Commissioner for Competition, a co-chair of the Trade and Technology Council, and, of course, a proponent of transatlantic cooperation and the values the Atlantic Council was established to promote over 60 years ago. Her robust portfolio focuses on a great many issues at the heart of the European project and of key importance to policymakers around the world. Today, that cooperation is complicated as policymakers grapple with the interplay between geopolitics and economics, with uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's trip uh, to China this coming week with French President Macron. It includes a connection between conflict and supply chains, the importance of green and digital transitions. These issues are exactly why the Atlantic Council has pushed for forward-leaning transatlantic solutions. It's led here in Washington by our Europe Center, run so capably by Jörn Fleck, the senior director. This is the home for the European Union in Washington, but we also tackle European issues across our 16 program and centers, including our Geoeconomic Center, our Digital Forensic Lab, uh, our Scowcroft Center. Uh, uh, Europe is really in the bloodstream of everything we do at the Atlantic Council. The last time you joined us, Madam Executive Vice President, we were about to launch our report, The European Union and the Search for Digital Sovereignty. And just a few months ago, our Europe Center published a follow-on project to that report, Digital Sovereignty in Practice. Executive Vice President Vestager, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to you, and we also look forward to your conversation with our Europe Sen Center Senior Director, Jörn Fleck, and to the question and answer portion with our audience. For those joining us virtually on Twitter, use the hashtag AC front page, hashtag AC front page. Madam Executive Vice President, welcome to Washington. The floor is yours. Good morning, and, uh, and thank you for that, indeed, I think, very warm welcome. 
Um, I cannot think of an organization more relevant these days than the Atlantic Council. Because uh, what we are in, in the midst of, uh, of course, is, uh, is a very small window uh, to make sure that we get sort of the design right for a fully digitalized world that honors the basics of our beliefs, the integrity and the respect of the individual, and that human rights, they are indeed uh, for everyone. And I think that was very well reflected um, in, in um, the outcome of the meeting between President Biden and uh, President Ursula von der Leyen in the recent uh, visit uh, here. Uh, they came out so strongly uh, on specifically three issues. Uh, first, obviously, the united, um, uh, the unity for, for Ukraine uh, going up against uh, unprecedented uh, Russian aggression uh, against a country that just wants to make their own choices. Second, the, the joint commitment uh, to accelerate our fight against climate change, to get uh, to what we call uh, net zero, but what is basically to make sure that humanity have just somewhat reasonable uh, terms uh, for living on this planet. And thirdly, to strengthen our economic uh, security. Uh, an issue that becomes so much more important uh, over the last years with, among other things, the chain in the Chinese approach uh, to globalization. I, I will address uh, the two uh, latter points and, and then, of course, we'll have a, a discussion. First, uh, uh, when it comes to getting to, to net zero, the European Union committed very early on, by 2050, we will be net zero. It is a pleasure to see that the US is also really stepping up uh, when it comes to this uh, approach. With the uh, Industrial um, Inflation Reduction Act in the European side with our Green Deal uh, Industrial Plan. And a couple of things here I think is really important. We need to figure out how to make sure that these uh, initiatives are mutually reinforcing. And, uh, and second, we need that net zero uh, is accelerated everywhere. Because the paradox is, of course, that while we have sort of this back and forth, short term, mid to long term, there is enough for everyone. We need net zero industries in the US, in Europe, in India, in China, in every jurisdiction. Otherwise, we will fail, humans on this planet, and biodiversity for that matter. And this is to say that it's really not a zero-sum game. And second, it is not served well by a transatlantic subsidy race. That would be way too expensive, and we can't afford it. We need to be much more strategic in how we target our resources in order to accelerate. Second thing uh, that is important for us is the uh, clean energy uh, incentive, incentive uh, dialogue. Uh, because what we can achieve here is, of course, transparency. Uh, that taxpayers know uh, how their uh, money is being spent and that it is spent purposefully. Uh, and second, that we can avoid disruptions when it comes to trade and investments. My guess is that later on we will discuss uh, open strategic autonomy but the reason why it's so important that it is open is that we can only take our own decisions by relying on one another when it comes to trade, when it comes to investment and supply chains. And that indeed would be uh, my last point when it comes to net zero. We need to reinforce transatlantic supply chains. And we need to do it in a way so that we do not end up in the same situation as we had when it came to vaccines. That all of a sudden supply chains, they were disrupted and we could not deliver what we wanted to. Because we do depend on one another, and we need to be able to trust that we can do that also on a rainy day. If you um, had the, the chance to listen to um, my president, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, yesterday uh, on her uh, speech uh, establishing uh, the European, European Commission approach uh, to China, you'd see that it focused very, very much on economic security. And, and what I think is, is really strong is that we have no interest 
in decoupling from the second largest uh, economy uh, of the world. Rather, we need to build a de-risking strategy in order to manage the relationship uh, that we will have uh, with China. And, and in doing that, uh, a couple of things are important. And one of them, of course, is that we reduce our strategic dependencies. Uh, if one was ever in doubt, uh, look at how the dependency on Russian gas, uh, how that uh, affected Europe. Uh, we should only need to learn this once. Now we need to act uh, upon it. And second, that we are bold in, in using our defensive tools. Uh, lately, the foreign subsidies instrument has come into effect. Uh, and that is a very forceful tool when it comes to uh, disturbing uh, competition within the single market, uh, especially, of course, if it's from non-market uh, actors. There's also uh, an element when it comes to how China is uh, developing technology and, and using technology. Here, there are a number of risks that we need to assess and figure out how to mitigate. Uh, one risk is, is dual use, but it doesn't stop to that. with that. It's also the integrity of data, it is disinformation, it's protection of human rights, and that must be key because we cannot throw away in just a few years what it has taken us decade after decade after decade to achieve. We will present uh, our strategy um, in, in a few months, uh, building uh, a collective response uh, with member states uh, of the European Union, uh, including also looking at outbound um, investment. But the thing is that it's not enough to address the, use, the risk of uh, autocracies uh, when they use uh, digital uh, technologies. Uh, we also have homework to do. Uh, I found it uh, very impressive uh, what President Biden uh, wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in an op-ed uh, where I think the, the main takeaway was the need to make sure that we keep uh, big tech uh, accountable. Uh, first, on, on privacy. Uh, back in 2016, uh, in the European Union, we put the um, uh, General Data Protection uh, Directive uh, into place. Um, it is uh, fully enforced. Uh, right now, there are actually two investigations into TikTok uh, and, uh, and their use of, uh, of data. Uh, as you will know, on, uh, on Commission work phones, there's no room uh, for TikTok uh, either. But that is really not enough. It's important to have, of course, a, a broad, legally-based uh, approach to this, because as long as the same kind of data is for sale, uh, and that China can buy it everywhere anyway, well, then we still have work to do. Second, um, on responsibility, when it comes to what content uh, we see, also a message by President Biden. Uh, in Europe, we are in the process of implementing the Digital Services Act. And that will make sure that platforms, they have systems in place so that illegal content is taken down, that they have an approach to harmful content, and that they preserve freedom of expression by enabling people to come back if they find that they are not being fairly treated. And very importantly, that the very large online platforms, that they make a risk assessment. Would our services be damaging to young people's mental health? Can our services be misused to undermine democracy? And if so, to mitigate those risks? At the European level, we do not legislate on content. That is for member states to do. But we legislate to make sure that the legislation on content is fully respected, because that is how democracy works. Thirdly, when it comes to healthy competition, in order to have open, contestable, dynamic markets that push for innovation. Also uh, a point of President Biden. Here we are in the process of uh, enforcing or implementing and enforcing the Digital Markets Act to make sure that those who today keep the gates of the digital markets, that they know exactly what are their obligations and what are uh, the things that they will have to do 
in order for that market to be open and contestable. We have very little time, and we can only do it together. And this is why I'm very happy that we're having this conversation here uh, in the framework of the Atlantic Council. I think we will go much more into detail, so I will leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Vice President, for the setting this rich table uh, across the, the nexus, as, as Fred Kemp said, of geopolitics, geoeconomics, and technology, uh, and a warm welcome from my side as well. Let's dive right in with the issue that's perhaps been top of mind for many in, in Washington, D.C., and in Brussels, as we saw from President von der Leyen's speech yesterday um, about the EU's China policy. You've warned of the increasingly complex relationship with China. What can we expect from the EU's reposturing, repositioning vis-a-vis -vis China, especially when it comes to the economic and, and technology relationship? Uh, if I wanted to make it, phrase it more pointedly, uh, can we expect more Lithuania or more Germany? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I sh would hope you could expect more Europe. Um, because we, I think five years ago, we made a China strategy, EU-China strategy. Three legs, um, partner when it comes to fighting climate change, systemic rival, we are a democracy, we do not consider China a democracy, and uh, an economic competitor. And what we have seen over the years, because we think that this still holds, is that the two legs, sort of economic competitor and systemic rival, those two things, they come closer and closer together because of this shift from focusing on economic growth to being much more ideological uh, from the Chinese side. And, and that, of course, entails us to put much more muscle uh, on the bone of the strategy so that we can take actions. And uh, today, it's the competence of member states, and, and I think it can remain that way. But we need to have a European approach to this, also because um, uh, we have, you know, related discussions within the framework of the Trade and Technology Council. And here it is very important that we, as European, have a much more um, well-defined uh, discussion among ourselves. Uh, also to, to figure out what is risky and what is not. Uh, you know, the rubber ducks and the pork chops, leave that alone. Uh, but the risk is if we are not precise, then also the rubber ducks and the pork chops become sort of kind of, ah, is this uh, also a risky thing? So I think precision uh, in, in what we see as risky is absolutely key, and this is what we're thriving for. You, you mentioned more muscle. Uh, you, you spoke of de-risking, as the president did yesterday in, in her speech, de-risking, not decoupling. Do you feel you have the tools at the European level? The president also mentioned new tools. You mentioned outbound investment controls as an option. Um, how are you thinking about the, this toolkit uh, when it comes to China, de-risking that relationship and focusing on, on confronting the systemic rivalry and economic mm. competition part much more than the cooperation leg? I, I think it's about how, how we combine the tools that we have. So now we just got the foreign subsidies regulation in place. We have the uh, international procurement uh, instruments. Um, we, would, uh, we have uh, investment screening uh, already uh, at a national and European level. Uh, and we will start discussing also outbound investment. But, but one of the things that we have realized is that one of the core issues of the international procurement instrument is reciprocity. But that is not enough. Uh, because reciprocity is not just, you know, market access, because that can be so many different things depending on the approach uh, of the other party. So, uh, so this is why we're thinking about how should we combine the tools that we have uh, in order to use them in, in the most strategic manner. We have a lot to get through. There's so much more there. But let me maybe switch to your second theme of the green transition. Uh, you, you've made yourself a name as, as the tough competition enforcer, as someone who's kept both private sector and government action in check to, to keep a level playing field in the EU's internal market. Um, but we live in a very different world, even from, from the start of your second term, where we've seen massive industrial policy action, um, government interventions, government support schemes, 
as a result of the pandemic, of Russia's war, of Europe's energy crisis. Um, and, and so how have your views evolved as, as the U.S. rolled out and is rolling out, uh, especially on the green transition, these support schemes? Um, how have your views evolved around what role competition policy has in that, what role state aid has in that, and, and how do you balance uh, between the need, as you said, in the short term to deploy more financing to get this transition right, but equally avoid the risk of fragmenting the internal market? Well, the green transition is a, is a massive endeavor. Uh, I, I will not compare, but I think you, uh, you need to go way back to find something similar. But the thing special about the green transition is that it is politically driven. Everyone went to Paris, you know, said, we'll do this. Uh, and then around the planet, uh, there is a, a democratic drive, a political drive to put this in place, which means that there's also a political responsibility. You cannot just rely on the market to deliver. But the paradox here is that you cannot succeed if you do not have the market. Because you, if you give up on the fundamentals, uh, for instance, you know, the dynamics of the single market, you give up on a lot of resilience. Because what the single market and the competition will give you, also trade-wise, is that it will give you many different suppliers and many different potential customers. And uh, if you give up uh, on the market, you also give up on the, on the dynamics that gives you innovation, which is absolutely key. Not only technological innovation, but also innovation in how we organize ourselves, which is absolutely key to fight climate change, that we reorganize a number of uh, processes in order, for instance, to get to circular economy. So, so the paradox here is that you have a political responsibility to make the transition happen, you cannot just rely on the market for it to take place. But you cannot be successful without the market and the market dynamics. And this is why it's so important to balance how you, how you subsidize, how you incentivize, how you fix the market failures that are out there in order not to break these market dynamics that are crucial for us all to be successful. Uh, and this is why we're very careful uh, in what we do. This is why we want the transparency. This is why we want it to be temporary. This is why we want it to be proportionate to what we want to achieve. Because we need the acceleration. Um, our sort of uh, transition framework uh, has an, an end date, end uh, 2025, but subsidies can be paid out far longer. But what we want to achieve with that is to make governments take decisions. Because we need acceleration. We are behind when it comes to fight climate change. We are, of course, very proud that 2022 carbon uh, emissions uh, lowered 2.5%. Uh, but as a planet, we are behind the curve. So we need that acceleration. And, and these are, are the balances. And then, of course, that we uh, use taxpayers' money in a way that crowd in private investment. Because there's a lot of funding out there that ought to be much more busy. And, uh, and here also, sometimes, if, if well designed, uh, the state's up, uh, subsidy can take the upper uh, tranche, the most risky one, and in doing that, crowding in much more private investment. You mentioned temporary, limited, proportionate, but um, are you not afraid that, that this dynamic takes on a, a life of its own, especially with your, your role as competition uh, commissioner? How, how, what do you watch? Where are your red lines? What are the indicators you, you watch when you take that more medium-term perspective? Well, I think there are quite a number of risks uh, in, in doing what we do, uh, but I see no alternative to it. Uh, I think it's 100% legitimate uh, to make sure that we uh, accelerate and that we make sure that in Europe that this acceleration we have ahead of us is not set on pause so that the acceleration takes place uh, in, in other jurisdictions. I, I find that 100% legitimate. But one of the risks, of course, is that sort of that something happens with, with sort of the DNA of, uh, of the CEOs of this world, that all of a sudden they are more sort of directed towards uh, which politician will, will ensure a subsidy rather than what business plan will make sure that my shareholders, uh, they make a profit and that the products that I make, uh, that they are fit for market in a sustainable manner. 
uh, just to, to mention one of the things that there is, of course, a risk of dependency of subsidies. And, and this is why this temporary uh, is so important to make sure that people see that, that this is not something that you should depend on forever, because it is a transfer from taxpayers to shareholders, and one should be careful in doing so. Thank you. Um, can I ask you one follow-up question on, you, you've mentioned in the context of the Inflation Reduction Act and the US-EU frictions, okay. let's say, uh, around mm. that, um, that um, our competitive, uh, competitiveness as Europe uh, our concerns cannot be put on Washington's doorstep alone. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what else, uh, we've never seen, or we haven't seen recently such a debate about Europe's longer term competitiveness. Uh, what are some other steps that you think should be taken by the EU to underpin, to strengthen that uh, beyond the immediate mm -hmm. IRA resolution, the energy crisis and so on? I think your question underlines the obvious, that you cannot build long-term competitiveness on subsidies. Long-term competitiveness is built on innovation, on uh, trade, on financing, and skills. And uh, the skills part is becoming a really sort of hard strategic nugget uh, to deal with because it's, uh, it's an increasing barrier uh, to growth in businesses. So, uh, you know, incentivizing uh, people to skill, to reskill, to upskill all through their lives. Uh, I think sometimes people say, oh, but that is soft. That is for ministers of education. They will do their thing. No, 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 no. This is a CEO matter. Uh, and we need uh, all businesses to engage here in order for people to see that my next job depends on, on this. And, um, and of course, uh, the trade part of it, uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, I think my colleague uh, responsible for trade, Valdis Dombrovsky, he usually say that 80 to, to 90 percent of, of uh, global growth will take place out of Europe the next 10 years. So if you want to plug into that trade, well, you better have an open mind. And, and that, of course, is a paradox in, in our open strategic autonomy, that we can only take our own decisions by being uh, in very strong partnerships uh, with the rest of the world. We'll come to trade and open strategic uh, autonomy in a second. I do want to remind everyone, we do want to get to questions here in, in, from our audience and virtually our audience. If you can line up at the microphone here on, on your left for questions later on. We'll take a first question from Francis Burwell, our distinguished fellow. But let's, let's turn to trade, uh, open strategic uh, autonomy and the Trade and Technology Council specifically. Um, we've seen this intensified dialogue between the United States and the European Union. Some would say proliferation of dialogues. Um, you're in town for the joint technology competition dialogue. You're later on launching the, the clean energy incentives dialogue with Secretary Yellen. Uh, there's the dialogue on the IRA. Um, but you also warned yesterday that under the foreign subsidies regulation that you already mentioned, um, you would have the power to review U.S. subsidies. So a signal to the U.S. here as, as we refine the IRA uh, discussion. How do, you, how do you get the balance right between that cooperation um, and checks while avoiding, on the other hand, a subsidies race you spoke about, a tit-for-tat, as you put it in, in an op-ed recently, especially between the United States and, and Europe? Well, I think it's... Um there can be cases for the foreign subsidy regulation uh, to look at, but I think they will be the absolute exception. Um, so that can be a discussion, but I think it's, it's the minor part of it. And, and the reason why the uh, transparency dialogues are so important is that they are the main tool to prevent that we get a subsidy raise. So we can, we can only authorize uh, you know, the same subsidy for the same business plan, so to speak. If it's in, in, in Poland, uh, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, if it's the same um, business plan, you can only have the same subsidy. So you cannot travel one member state uh, or the other to say, uh, they will give me so much, what will you give me? Uh, and of course, we would like to, to achieve the same thing uh, with the US, which of course is, is really difficult because we give subsidies in different ways, we have different markets, different legal frameworks. But we do think that transparency and that the business community realizes that we're looking uh, is part of the deterrence 
uh, of traveling the Atlantic uh, to say I can make more on the other side uh, from the taxpayer, so, so you should give me more. Um, because then we do not get uh, most sort of net zero uh, for the public funds invested. And, and that, of course, is absolutely crucial because we need as much as possible. But again, if I can push you a little bit on that, the, the Trade and Technology Council was supposed to align or help align the United States and, and Europe there more. Critics would say we haven't seen much in terms of concrete deliverables and real results. We have the fourth TTC meeting coming up uh, in Sweden in May. What, what can we expect from that? And how do you turn this, this mechanism where you've built good exchange into a real action forcing mechanism that delivers and that also sustains in the long term? Well, I think uh, I do think we deliver. Uh, we have, for instance, the AI roadmap that has produced a, a tool to enable businesses to figure out, do I think that I can, can market uh, my AI tool on both sides of the Atlantic? Uh, we have the AI for Good initiative uh, to make available uh, computing power, uh, mathematic modeling uh, for, for those who may not possess it uh, in order to invite more uh, into the game of, uh, of AI. Uh, we have worked for, on semiconductors for a very, very long time, uh, both to, to analyze what caused the shortages, how to prevent those from happening again, and how to make sure that we can rely on each other on a rainy day. Because Europe will not be self-sufficient in semiconductors, neither will the US. Uh, you very often need a full sort of suite of semiconductors in a vehicle, whatever you want to produce. So we need to be able to rely on, on each other. Here we have produced results as well. Uh, we have something very specific as, as the common charger uh, standards for, uh, for heavy duty vehicles. And we have the work on, uh, on standards. Because what we both realized, I think, at the same time, is that we have been too much hands off uh, when it comes to standards. Uh, one of the successes is the, now the leadership of the International Telecommunications Union. So it is uh, led by, uh, by an American, it is deputed by a European, uh, I think a great success for what we uh, wanted to achieve. And uh, if you want to have questions, you should stop me now because I can continue in <laughs> telling you what we have produced of results. All right, we look forward to the fourth meeting uh, in, in, in Sweden then and see more of these results. Um, you already mentioned open strategic autonomy that's often uh, brought in connection with your very ambitious digital agenda that, that you've pursued, especially in the current term, most notably the landmark pieces of, of, of legislation around the Digital Markets Act, DMA, Digital Services Act that you already mentioned, DSA. As you go into full implementation over the next mm -hmm. two years or so, what does success look like? You, you've spoken about passing legislation is one thing, implementing, executing, enforcing it is another thing. How are you thinking about this? What does success look like for you in that implementation enforcement phase specifically? Maybe just one more thought on, on the Trade and Technology Council because um, I will take with me what you say because the Trade and Technology Council is nothing if the stakeholders do not see results. This, this is not for, for, for Jean and me to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Uh, th this is for, for results for, for the broader community. This is why the stakeholder dialogue is built into every ministerial meeting. Uh, but leave that aside, we, we can, can discuss uh, that later. On, um, on, on your question here, in, in my experience, when you change legislation, that is difficult. But what you have changed is perception. When you implement legislation, you want to change behavior hundred times more difficult. You know, anyone who has tried to stop smoking, from the idea to execution, bit of a stair to climb. So I'm, I'm really respectful of the work that it will take uh, from, from uh, my teams, from, from the people that we have, uh, you know, prioritized uh, to do this, because what we have promised uh, the Commission, Parliament, Council, is that we want a digital market that is open. Uh, that consumers can choose to have a second uh, app store on their phone, that uh, businesses uh, can get access to data that they would otherwise not have access to, that they can keep their own data to themselves 
uh, if they are indeed uh, not a gatekeeper and that they should not fear that their data is being used uh, against them, so to speak. So, so we want to see a change of behavior in that digital marketplace. We'll come to the question of our distinguished fellow in just a second. One last question from me um, around the discussion. We've seen this intensifying debate uh, around the disruptive potential of AI, the mm -hmm. recent letter by some AI leaders uh, on, on pausing, if that's even possible, um, AI development. Does, does this discussion around chat GPT especially uh, change anything in, in how you think about tech regulation and the AI Act being uh, developed and, and revised. Um, how are you thinking about that in light of that debate, stripping away a little bit of that hype around, mm. around this as well? I, I think the, the letter on pausing is, is really important because it shows that there is a concern that is so much broader than among regulators. Uh, we have been working with regulating the use of AI now for quite some time. Parliament is in the process of finalizing uh, their negotiating position so that we get to what is forbidden when it comes to the use of AI, what are the high-risk cases where you know, your, your dignity, um, you being seen as, uh, as an individual and not as your personal code or your race or your political opinion. I, I think we are on track there. But the important thing is that Obviously, many more people have themselves paused and looked at this and say, hmm, maybe it's a good thing if the regulator steps in. Uh, I think a pause would be um, not only difficult to achieve, uh, but maybe also not the way to go, because as we speak, they're coding in China. So uh, I think what we need is direction. When you say, well, this is where we want to go. Um, just as, uh, as direction was needed when, uh, uh, when all, all of a sudden Sydney appeared uh, and wanted to break up a marriage. That, I think, shows where we don't want to go. Also, if you sort of extrapolate that to large-scale deployment, then, uh, then I think we should agree on what are the guardrails, what is the direction of travel uh, when it comes to AI. Thank you. So we'll finally turn to... Questions from the audience. Uh, Fran Burwell, our distinguished fellow. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President, for being here. I wanted to return to the question of implementation, uh, not only of DSA and DMA, but you have the AI Act and the Data Act coming down the road at you. Um, I know you've been hiring people uh, to be implementing these things, and the Commission sees itself as having a role. But should we actually be talking about a data and tech agency that would be more technical? The commission has a political role. And I wanted to follow up briefly on something you said about the sharing of data under the DMA by gatekeepers. You are probably aware there's a growing discussion here about how to protect that data when it's being shared, both in terms of IP and in terms of other malicious actors somehow gaining access to it through fake companies or whatever. What assurances can you provide about the protection of that data that will be required to be shared and how limited the, uh, the opportunities will be. Thanks. Yeah, um, on, on the agency thing, even, even though we are hiring, um, we have very limited resources. And uh, I think it's, it's important uh, to be very much aware of that. And, and this is why I think it is, uh, it's a much more efficient use of resources to, to have them within the commission services, but of course with uh, specific directorates and also with uh, specific uh, regulations in order to make sure that they stay prudent, so to speak. Um, and it's also important for commission services to be much more uh, sort of tech savvy. Uh, in, in my own uh, services, we're in the process of establishing a chief technology officer uh, with an, an office uh, to support his work so that the, the advice that, that I would get would not only be from our chief economist, our legal service, but also uh, from the chief uh, technology officer. And I think that should be the direction of travel that we, we get to, to hire more and more people 
that can sort of cross fertilize, cross pollinate uh, between uh, the different um, uh, academic backgrounds uh, and the different backgrounds when it comes to, to hands on experience from, from other jobs. On, on the protection of uh, our data being, uh, being transferred, uh, I think that is a, that's a tricky question also because the Data Act is not done yet. Uh, so we will not know what will be uh, the final provisions. But what we have seen so far is that with sort of our uh, open data uh, legislation that we have already, that has created so many opportunities for smaller businesses. Like, for instance, the Copernicus data, they are open, they are for free, there is an interface, you can just register, and then you have access uh, to, you know, world-class satellite data. Uh, same with uh, data from uh, public authorities uh, within the union, they make all of that available. A lot of businesses is being created uh, on that basis. And the reason why I mention this is that now with, with uh, AI being on, on everybody's mind, um, we talk a lot about the risks. It is important always to insist that we are dealing with something that holds immense potential for better education, better healthcare, fighting climate change, uh, all of that. Uh, but we'll come back uh, when we have the data act uh, and be more precise. We'll count on that. Um, let me bring one quick question, please, very precise, from Olga Karkova from our Global Energy Center. Thank you so much, Jorn, uh, and thank you so much, Dinar, to have you here with us at the Atlantic Council. You mentioned the importance of a strategic and a constrained uh, approach when it comes to support schemes. Um, the Net Zero Industry Act doesn't uh, really bring in additional money, but it provides a better way to leverage existing money and also streamlines on how the projects are implemented. Is it fair to assess that they, we really shouldn't expect any additional uh, financial schemes, financial support under the Net Zero Industry Act, and it's really going to be more focused on kind of leveraging and accelerating how the existing uh, incentives are being implemented because in so many ways they do compare quite equally with what's happening on on the US side they're just maybe not marketed or streamlined or cleared as much it always makes one happy when one is read so well and so succinctly thank you very much for this um, because when it comes to to the the temporary uh, state aid rules to enable uh, what is also in scope of uh, of the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that we did before. We can do that quite fast. It's a commission decision. For, for the Net uh, Zero Act, what we, we want to do is indeed to streamline. Because for, for, for many businesses, when I've been speaking with them and, and colleagues as well, we have very broad, broad uh, outreach. They say, yes, funding is important, but permitting. If we cannot get a fast yes, can we get a fast no? Uh, so that at least we know that we should go somewhere else uh, uh, and ask uh, for another um, plot of land to build our wind farm or, or whatever it may be. So it's, it's worth a lot uh, to be, you know, instead of, of doing permitting in a sequence, then doing it in parallel, having a one-stop shop so that you can go to one person who feels responsible for actually providing uh, those uh, permitting. And, and that approach is really important. And here, we're not cutting corners when it comes to biodiversity uh, or protection of the environment as such. We're just asking everyone to speed up. And instead of sort of, of saying, that deadline is in the far future, I don't have to do anything now. Say, no, that deadline is in the very near future. We better get our act together so that we can make that balancing uh, act. Well, thank you so much, Madam Vice President. We're unfortunately out of time. You put it very succinctly. We have a small window, very little time, and we can only do it together. At the Atlantic Council, we'll, we'll keep working on that with you, with your American counterparts and allies around the world. Uh, we wish you a successful remainder of your thank visit. You. I hope this was a good warm up for you meeting with all those antitrust lawyers <laughs> later on. And, um, and uh, I hope we can tempt you to come back. You almost promised us with the Data Act. So we'll, we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. It was my and pleasure. thank you to our in-person audience here in the room. Thank you to our virtual audience. Uh, make sure you continue to follow the Atlantic Council and AC front page. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.